Hi everyone, I'm Dr. Yosefa Fogel-Rubel and this is One on One, Women Talk Torah, a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Tanya White is an international lecturer, writer, and educator with a focus on Tanakh and contemporary Jewish thought. Tanya is a graduate of the Matan Matmidot program in which she studied in the years 2005 to 2011. She is currently teaching in Matan Ra'anana and has taught in Matan's branches in Zichron Yaakov and Chashmonaim. Tanya, it's great to have you here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Great. I always love to have a chance to meet other Matan staff that otherwise I would never have the opportunity to meet. So it's really exciting. Thanks so much. Pleasure. I hope we get to meet in person one day soon. <laughs> Amen. Bezrat Hashem. I really like to start off all these conversations with the same question because I find it fascinating and moving to hear the different ways that women find their path and their voice in the Torah world. So take us however far back you would like to go, how you started on the path of Torah learning and eventually teaching Torah as well. It's very interesting because I don't think it was any ever anything I was particularly passionate about, especially my um, childhood education, the system I was in. It was It was certainly not something that I ever felt I would make a career out of that was for certain um I had I was brought up in a religious home full of warmth full of love full of an incredibly beautiful religious experiences but not as a subject I desired to study um I think the turning point was my year off I went to Orot and I remember walking out of Rav Menachem Liebtag's um Tanakh class and just being blown away I had never experienced Tanakh in that way before. And I called my mom up. I said to mom, mommy, I don't understand. I have been in this education system. I've been learning Jewish studies for maybe 13 years of more, 15 years of my life. And I have never in that one hour class experienced something like that before than I had done in 15 years of learning. Um, I was, I was gutted. I was actually really upset that I had wasted, I felt like I'd wasted those years. Um, And from then on, I also had Rav Alex Israel teach me. I had some great teachers and I really started seeing things in a totally different light. When I came back, I did my degree in international relations at London School of Economics. And then I decided to do my master's in Jewish studies. Again, I don't think it was necessarily something that I had said, I'm going to carve out a path as a Torah teacher at all. Um, It was just something that really sparked my interest. Um, And I went to do that and I did my doctorate. My thesis in my master's was in um, the philosophy of the Holocaust in Emil Fackenheim. Um, And I think that's when I also fell in love with philosophy. That's really when I began. I had this strange compulsion after the philosophy classes to know more. It almost felt like a calling. It was like enticing. I felt like I needed to understand the language of philosophy. I needed to understand what these thinkers were telling me. That fact that Judaism wasn't just about halacha, but was also about ideas, was also something that was very compelling for me. Um, and that's really, I think, how I, I, we made Aliyah. Um, and I remember very clearly I called uh, Michelle Farber, actually, before I moved to Renana. And I asked her about Matan in Renana because I, I decided that that was I had I taught in a high school in JFS for those that from England know for a couple of years before I made Aliyah. But I knew that I didn't want to teach in a school in Israel. And I, that's when I think I really began to feel that maybe the path I wanted to go on was in more adult education. I spoke to Michelle and she said, come learn in Matan uh, Hasharon and see how you feel about it. Um, and I went to meet Oshra and I walked in the door of Matan Hasharon. At the time they were in a shul and I walked in, They were, their office was in the Mamad. And Oshra straight away took me under her wing. She said, right, you're coming, you're learning with us. And she was the first one afterwards where they called from Zichon. They wanted someone to come and teach. And she gave me that job. And eventually I got to where I got to. But yeah, 
It was. So, um, so you're saying the Matan experience was a, a big door opener. Matan um, was a massive door opener for me, um, especially um, Osh has really been a mentor for me along the way. She was the one that had pushed me very often um, and really believed, believed in me. Is, is, um, is Matan a place that you feel you were able to work on textual skills? A lot of school systems in Chutzaretz don't really give their students a lot of textual skills. There's a lot of reasons why, and that's there's no blame in that statement. But um, I know often from studying with other English students and, and meeting them later that it's often a, an Achilles heel for them. And they feel, again, many of us started later in life. But do you feel that Matan is a place where you were able to cultivate that? Did it happen earlier? Was it just autodidactic? How, how did that work for you? It's it's still an Achilles hill. I really I feel in an honestly in a way I feel like it always will be. I I lack the textual skills. I remember coming to Arot and the Canadians yeah. and the Americans were miles ahead of the English girls, like incomparable. Um, it it was and it still is and it always will be. Matan definitely allowed me to. Um, develop those skills um, at a much higher level. And to be honest, it's something I work very, very hard on. My textual skills, even I, I've learned philosophy, I've also taught myself. Um, sure. You know, I did my master's in, 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 in Jewish studies. It wasn't specifically in philosophy. Um, and it's, I really, a lot of it is self-taught. I remember so clearly giving a lecture once and there were a few English people um, that was at the back of the hall and the hall was filled and they they turn around I think they turn to Osher or they turn to someone else they says they said to her you have no idea where she has come from the fact that she can stand there and give her she or <laughs> <laughs> so I'm I guess I'm proud of that yeah. um because yeah it, it's definitely something that uh, is lacking I don't know now I haven't been in England for many many years so I, I'm not able to tell you what the system is now but certainly in my time um, the Jewish studies textual uh, a bit. I, you know, I said I walked out of Rav Liebtag's class on. He gave a shiur on Brit Ben Habatarim, and I'll never forget it. It was it was so clear in my mind. He'd given a shiur on Brit Ben Habatarim, and I had learned it in school. I had learned the verse, the pasuk, with the Rashi and the Ramban. No context. I had no idea what it was talking about. All I knew was how to answer the direct question of what does that word mean and what does Rashi yeah. think about that word. And I remember walking out of Rav Liebtag's class thinking, ah, now I get it. Now I get the whole context of what a brick is, what even is a covenant. No one yeah. taught us what that was. Um, so I think it's not even just the textual skills, which for sure are lacking. I think it's the whole um the whole big, the the more macro perspective, which I think is is massively lacking. Sure. I also want to be very clear in this conversation. There's no uh, besmirching going on, and there's a lot of teachers all over the world who are working very hard. Uh, I do. I think that a general lack of familiarity with Tanakh, um, which is not helped by a language barrier. Um, and, and those, those, those two together create a tremendous amount of challenge. Um, and I, I see that also Definitely. still exists today. I'm working with teachers, um, not in North America and, and it's a big, uh, it's a big challenge. It's a challenge. Yeah. Yeah. I, I understand that. Uh, I wanted to ask about your role modeling. Who are the, the figures or the uh, real life role models that have inspired you in your learning and or your so... teaching? So. If you're going to ask me from the Torah, the first person for sure, my favorite character in the Torah is Miriam Hanavia. She has, to me, the most incredible inner strength that really she directs, she channels to creating leaders. And for me, that's one of the biggest um, ideas, is the idea that she creates rather than just being a leader and having your followers she herself creates leaders we see when they cross the red sea and moshe singing and the people are singing after him though it says that um right she responds to the women she has bought these women to become, or she's kind of brought these women up to become leaders themselves for them to sing their own song. 
If you're going to ask me about a, a you know a contemporary person, it would definitely be Rabbi Sachs. Um, um, who for me was not just a, you know, he didn't just, the couple of times I met him personally, he set me on a certain path and I am incredibly grateful to that. But one thing that came out um, through all of the various things that were written about him is that he again like Miriam right if we're going to take the the two is he was a leader that created leaders you know he didn't just create followers he really created leaders you speak to anybody who spoke to him or who met with him he really channeled leadership skills in people um, and he really honed in on what each person that came to see him, what they could give over as a leader rather than just as a follower. And I, you know, besides for everything else I can say about him, you know, the fact that he brought together thought, you know, Jewish thought and Tanakh, which is something I feel very passionately about. But I think on a much more kind of personal level or perhaps a, a leadership level, I think that's that's a very, you know, very often leaders want followers, you know, to be a leader, you want followers. You know, it, it really reminds me, there was a, a beautiful interview with Rabbanit Malkabina in uh, in the Diu Khan section in, in the Israeli paper, Mokor Shon. And that's something also that came through very, very powerfully in what she said, that they were talking to her about students and how to create different students. And she said, we're looking in Matan to create leaders. Yeah. Uh, and she said, you know, they always say, we want chaylim, right? We want, we want tons and tons of soldiers. We want there to be tons of women learning Torah as soldiers. And she said, that's true. She said, but in Matan, we're really going after, we want to create leaders and we want to create leaders who are of, of a very high caliber. And so she said, I'll take, I'll take a hundred or 200 if it means getting very high quality female scholars over, over the Chayalim, right? Over having, and that, that's exactly that point. And yeah. I, I really want to yeah. say, I, I wrote to her right after the interview and I wrote to her, I said, I, I was not that I, I'm a student. I look at myself as a student, do you know what I'm saying? But I said, it was such an honest, beautiful interview. Um, but that was exactly her point. She said, I'm, we're looking to create female leaders, you know, in this, in what we're trying to do in the whole world of Matan. And I think that obviously she's been unbelievably successful with all the beautiful Matan staff. Yeah, totally. I was going to say Matan really, really has created incredible leaders have come out of Matan. And, and for sure, Ma Rabbanit Malka is, is a prime example of somebody who leads in order to create leaders. Um, and I think that's the beauty of Matan. And that's why when you enable, when you make space for others to be leaders, when you enable that, it's almost like it reminds me of what we talk about Hashem, the Tzimtzum, right? That he, Hashem made the space for the world to cre be created. When a leader doesn't feel that he has to take all the space, but allows, contracts himself in order to allow for other leadership, it 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 it, it needs. I mean, it it in um there has to be a sense of humility to do that as well. Yeah, you know, a leader has to be humble. I was saying um, that I in a very small a small level, is it uh, as a parent? Um, I really try and do that yeah. with my kids who are still young, but I really, I, I really try and use that model in my home also. Of I don't, I can't be in charge of you all the time, right? I'm trying to enable you to be independent humans so that we can all have a part in the leadership for this house. It's I, I, I really think about that piece a lot of what you're saying. About, yeah, about creating leaders around us. Yeah, Tanya. What phenomenon in women's learning have you seen change over the years that you've been involved in higher women's education? So I don't think from my perspective, I've seen a massive change from when I actually entered women's learning, meaning when I started really at Matan in a serious way. I've definitely seen a huge change in general. Um, I remember my bat mitzvah, for example, we had a very small, you know, my brothers all had like a nice party and they had obviously their call-ups and a nice party. And I had like a very small party 
party in my house. And my parents were very modern orthodox. It wasn't that they weren't, you know, forward thinking. It's just that was the done thing. So I think, gener- you know, and women weren't learning. There wasn't Gemara learning for women or anything like that. I think there's been a huge change, a huge shift. Um, also a, a conscious, like a, con- a conscious shift, um, uh, certainly amongst the Dati Lormi, you know, um, community. But I think if I would say anything, I think the biggest change, honestly, has been a movement from hierarchy to grassroots. Um, it reminds me a little bit of the Gemara of uh, Tanur Shalachnai, right? When, again, what the rabbis, there was a real polemic in that Gemara of um, Rabbi Eliezer ben Herkinus, and he was arguing with the Chachamim about whether or not the uh, an oven was richly pure or impure. And, it, and he brings so many different proofs. And eventually he says, you know, you've got to listen to me. And he brings down a butt call, he had a heavenly voice. And, they, and then the rabbis turn around, they say, listen, loba he you know, the authority doesn't lie in heaven anymore. And I think if we take that paradigm of the destruction of the temple and the rabbis saying, listen, where does authority lie? Does it lie now with the divine voice, with the divine authority given to us through Sinai? Or does it lie now with the with the Chachamim, with the rabbis? And they needed polemically to prove that authority laid with them in order for them to move Judaism forward. And in essence, what was happening was there was a, re- a kind of revolution coming from the grassroots, right? That's how I see it. Today, we're again in a very malleable period. We're in a period both, um, you know, humanity as a whole, I think, moving from a post, uh, from a modern to a postmodern way of, of, of looking at things. And uh, just generally, our consciousness, I think, has expanded massively on many levels today. Um, and I think also on a very Jewish level, we've moved from, you, you know, we had the this terrible event of six million Jews being killed. We've had the creation of a modern state, which is unprecedented in Jewish history. Um, and I think what we're seeing is that women's Torah learning is something that we are grappling with on many levels. What I really have seen is that women today are turning around, even in the very, even in the more traditional, even in the more Haredi sectors, let's even say, right, that they're turning around and they're saying, if we want change to happen, we are the ones that, you know, like Muhammad Gandhi talks about, you need to be the, if you, you want to change the world, you have to be that change. And I really feel that the women are taking the authority back themselves. They're saying, you know what, we respect tradition and we respect the authority of the rabbis. But at the end of the day, if we want something to change, we're the ones that have to do it. And, you know, I, I really I see it so often. There was this beautiful Yomi Yun that Matan did, um, Matan Sharon did on uh, Miniyut, right, on sexuality. And it was an incredible, incredible day. And at one point, a few of the speakers said to the women, you know, if we want change to happen, it has to come from us because we can't, it's not necessarily always going to come from above. And I, I really, um, I really think it's something quite profound. Um, and, and that's what I really see. That's, that's the change that I see. And, and moving forward, what are some of the, you know, so much as things have changed very quickly. Of course, many will say that it hasn't changed quickly enough, as, as always, it's the case with change and progression. Um, but what if you could pinpoint something that you would love to see change in the coming future, uh, or perhaps for your daughters as well in the future? What what would that so be? I have to be honest, I think that, you know, there's two ways of changing. There's a revolution and there's evolution. Um, and it was actually interesting because I was reading recently about this concept by someone called Arnold Van Gennep um, called liminality. And it really made me think also about the period that we're going through because he speaks about this idea of separating one space from another. Um, and it's like this transitioning between borders and boundaries and restructuring of identity um, and all of these things. Right. And I it really made me think a lot about this idea of women and Torah learning um, about what, you know, how quickly do we move forward? Should it be incremental? Should it be quicker than we're going? Honestly, from my perspective, 
I I think we're going at a good pace. Um, what change would I like to see? I'd like to see there being, I, I tell you what, when I was saying Kaddish for my father, I found it. There were moments I found really, really difficult, especially when I was standing there and we were waiting for a 10th man. And I was, I was the, I was a woman. We had nine men and me, right? And it happened on more than numerous occasions. And I almost felt invisible. There was a sense of feeling invisible. What? I don't count. Un- uncounted. 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 Right. Yeah. I was so grateful that that only happened to me once throughout a whole year, but I would dreaded that. Right. So we time. live, I'd like to see a shift in, in outlook, in consciousness, in, in the way people view things in perspective. Um, I think that's really important. Do I want a woman to count for a minion? I'd like to think that maybe, you know, by the time my daughters have children or grandchildren, we would perhaps get to the point where women would be included as a minion, even with the in, in orthodoxy, women being more included in tefillah. Yeah, it's not something, I'll be honest, that I feel passionately I need, but I do think it's something that we should be looking towards at some point. Um, um, when I was at the Hadran Siyam with my two eldest daughters, it was the most awesome experience, awesome from the word awe, and we'll talk about it again, but really I found it emotionally one day, it was wondrous, um, but one of the things that was very kind of interesting was when it came to doing Kaddish for at the end um, of the Hadran, they asked, they said, we have 10 men present and we're going to say Kaddish. And I found that on the one hand that I, two emotions went through me. One emotion was, hold on a minute, there's a group of thousands of women here saying Hadran, having learned Gemara for seven years, you know, having learned Dafyami for seven years, and we have to rely on a group of 10 men in order for us to say Kaddish. So there was that, and then immediately, it was almost this kind of dual emotion. Wow, that is incremental change. That's evolution and not revolution. Um, where you recognize and you have reverence for the tradition and you understand that you are changing something within the context of something far bigger and far greater than you, right? So there's the reverence, there's the tradition, there's halakha, and at the same time, within that framework, there's a deep and passionate will a grassroots kind of push towards incremental change because that's what needs to happen today if we want to keep Judaism alive. For me, that was the moment I was proud to be part of an orthodox of orthodoxy and still to be part of an orthodoxy that looked that is looking and looks towards the future. That for me really was the defining moment. Right. And that, that, um, that's a really, I, I never heard of that memory, by the way, I've heard a lot of women talk about the event right. that I unfortunately was not able to get to due to geographic, uh, <laughs> limitations, but that little piece of frustration that comes in that moment is what keeps things moving forward. And so they're both, they're both so important, both the appreciation and the frustration, um, exactly. and, and the appreciation keeps the frustration in its context, right? It, that, that, that is the orthodoxy piece in that moment. Um, and that's a really powerful memory. I really appreciate you, uh, you sharing yeah. that. I'm going to pivot, uh, us in our conversation to hearing a little bit more about your, your doctoral writing. Uh, there's, you know, when someone's been working on a project for so many years, there's so many things that we could talk about, but I, I really just want to ask you, um, I know that you're writing about the relationship between the post-Holocaust theology and postmodern thinking in the work of a modern theologian, uh, Rav Professor Irving or Yitz Greenberg, as many know him to, to be, uh, married, by the way, to those who don't know, to Blue Greenberg, who's sort of one of the, I don't know, most famous American Orthodox feminists, uh, started Jofa, I believe. And, she was one uh, of the founders. One yeah. of the founders, yeah, of Jofa. So how did you get to this topic uh, of what you're writing about? How did you arrive at that? And also, 
I to write about someone who's still alive is is such an interesting experience. Uh, I write about texts that are so old. <laughs> I know. So tell us a little bit about how you got there. How did I get to the topic? So it's an interesting one. Also goes back to Rabbi Sachs, um, Zetzal. And uh, I met with him in 2002. I had just written my my thesis for my master's on Emil Fackenheim, a very well-known post-Holocaust philosopher and thinker. And I was talking to Rabbi Sachs about my thesis. And he said to me, oh, have you come across Rabbi Yitz Greenberg? And I said, well, actually, as it happens, I, I had kind of come across him before. Um, I had learned his. But I, he said, you know, you should really look at him. You should think about writing something on him. And I went back. That was that was back in 2002, you know, um, and I went back and I started reading. And I must tell you that I read the first thing I read was what he is it was an essay called um cloud of smoke pillar of fire um it was his main kind of um post holocaust um paper and in that paper he speaks about the notion of moment faith of dialectical faith which he named calls after moment faith of um buber martin buber and in his dialectical faith, he speaks about the idea that when you're faced with burning children, you can't think about the modern, the redemption of the modern state of Israel. And when you're looking at the redemption of the modern state of Israel, you can't think about burning children, meaning the only kind of faith that we can have after the Holocaust is dialectical faith. And it reminded me of my grandfather, who was a Holocaust survivor, my my uh, maternal grandfather. Um, he died when I was 13. He died very young. He was 67. And um, I remember, we'll never forget, he was most loving, caring man. And he, every Pesach, and very religious, you know, went to shul every day. And But every Pesach, when it came to Vihisha Amda, he used to start screaming. And he used to say, it's not true. God didn't save us. He never saved us all. He lost his entire family. He was the only surviving member of his family after the Holocaust. And my my mother and her sisters used to say, yes, but daddy, look around the table, look at your grandchildren. But he just, and for me as a child, it was immense. I, I, was, it was, I was terrified, honestly. It was very, very scary. And I couldn't reconcile this, you know, pious kind of, grandfather who was this religious father wrapped in a talit in shawl that I remember seeing with this what seemed to be like a heretic screaming at God and being so angry with him and I think as an adult or you know certainly as a 21 23 I think it was a time 23 year old when I read um, Rabbi Greenberg's dialectical faith for the first time I suddenly realized that this was the faith my grandfather had and probably the faith so many post-holocaust survivors had and it spoke to me in such a deep and um, such a personal way that there was something, it wasn't just philosophy, right? It was something so personally touching. Um, when I came to writing, when I decided to write my doctorate, um, again, I spoke to a few different people. And people advised me to go and meet him. And I went to go meet, um, I, I really decided that I wanted to write it on him but I first and foremost thought I can't you know spend years and years of my life writing on someone who is alive and not having met them I, by the way that was the first I, question I, I had in my mind I said yeah. have you met him has he read what you've written <laughs> okay yeah so you go to meet him no he had I speak to him all the time he's oh, wow. incredibly wow. Uh, incredibly humble person it has been honestly it's been the greatest privilege of my Are life the first to write person on him. to write about him so I went to go meet him and him and Blue. Blue was there as well. And I walked out the room and I just said, wow, this is someone that lives and breathes the Torah that he teaches. You know, his main focus is the idea of Tzela Melokim. His main focus of ethical Judaism is this idea that we're all created in the image of God. And he breathes that day in day out and it you just see it you you meet him he has an awe he has a he has an aura about him and I walked out the I walked out, I was I met him at his son's um, house in Renana and I walked out the the door and I called my husband and I said 
this is the person I'm writing my doctorate on. <laughs> um, and I haven't looked back. It's been incredible. Although I have to say the process itself has been very, very challenging. It would not be times. a doctorate if there wasn't torture involved. And it's, it's, part, it's yeah. part of the process, unfortunately. Um, yeah, yeah. It's been, I, you know, it's been intertwined with a lot of personal challenges. And obviously, my husband being a surgeon does not help. Um, you know, he's been incredibly supportive. But it's been, it's, you know, bringing up a family and um, some major family challenges along the way and you know and COVID this year hasn't helped either it's, it's been very frustrating I've had an incredible um, supervisor who has been supportive the whole way along um, and also has really believed in me I think honestly that's one thing is 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 when people believe that you have the ability to do something it really pushes you um, and and Rav Yitz has been unbelievable support you know every time I write to him and very often I'll write to him and I'll ask him is that what you meant and he said you know now more what I meant than I know what totally. I meant totally oh this is an am- um, this is an amazing thing to be able to do to write to someone and ask that and it's uh, as a writer which you also are you're also a phenomenal writer and you we know that when we put things out to the world they have their own life and so who knows what we thought about when we wrote them all those years ago and we could have been thinking about something else, right? But then we put it out into the world and it has its own life. And that's so beautiful that he can, that he can say that so to you. So it's really that, interesting because I, I was you, really thinking. You know it says more yeah. than I do. That's an unbelievable. It's a very humble piece. That It's, it's amazing. He's, he's a to, very, very humble person. But I really, it really made me think also about this whole idea of, you know, postmodern, the postmodern way of reading a text, whether a text, whether the authority, authority of the text comes from the mm. author or the authority comes from the reader. You know, in a way, it actually reminds me a little bit of what we were talking about in terms of revol- evolution or revolution. You know, when you say, well, the the authority of the text is just with the reader, you know, then you're not giving any authority at all to the text. You're kind of just giving the authority to the person who's reading it. Um, And when you say the authority is just with the author, then that's allowing no innovation or creativity with the reader. I think it's somewhere in the middle. I genuinely think it's somewhere in the middle. In the same way, when we're talking about, you know, Torah and Halakha and the development and, you know, evolution, revolution, I think it has to be somewhere in the middle. Yeah, I mean, that Um, that debate exists certainly in the Tanakh world uh, of academia where I sit and I, I agree with you. I certainly ascribe and teach in a way that is somewhere in the middle. Uh, I'm not postponed enough that I don't, I think that authorial intent is critical when it comes to Torah. Yeah. Uh, but I also think that sometimes we can also be creative in our interpretation and that's okay, that that's what we have to add. I'm just curious also, um, please God, you'll finish your, your doctorate in the coming year. Um, all, all things considered, um, where, where do you see yourself moving forward with your doctorate from here in general, um, for your own personal vision? Where do you see yourself? I definitely want to continue teaching, um, something I'm really passionate about and I definitely want to continue writing as much as I can. Um, I feel like women and writing is, is a tough one. Um, I've spoken to a lot of women who should be writing and are not. I think women are perfectionists and I think, uh, I think women are, the creativity is, there's so much in their heads, it's sometimes difficult for them to sit down and actually zone in and focus. And I found that very much writing my doctorate, especially this year during COVID. It's been very difficult to find the headspace. Um, and, um, but I, you know what, life's a journey. Uh, Things always surprise me. And I really also feel that things just, they come things, you know, I don't, I, I'm not sure I want to plan exactly where I want to go. I definitely want to use, you know, my doctorate towards perhaps maybe a little bit towards more academic, academic areas or academia, but I'm very, I, I've not decided, um, I've certainly not set out a definite path ahead of me. Um, I'd like to see what, what is thrown up and you know and what comes uh, the journey is still ahead as they say beautiful i i think i do think there's also um a piece here that that has that's coming through in the conversations that i'm having with women um you know different people have different limitations sometimes it's financial they have to define a career which sometimes will push them out of the tutorial world or perhaps push them forward in it uh, and I also think that women's careers in general come in different chapters. And sometimes it takes um, 
sometimes before women have children, which might happen later in life, they have time to sort of develop their voice and their career path. And, and for other women, I think that often that takes shape sometimes at the end of their childbearing years. And as they go forward, that they gain the confidence and have the time, as you said, to sit down and write. I think every day of my life, I don't write things that I want to write. Um, I just don't have the I don't have the time and the freedom at this point in life. Totally with um, you on that. You know, when I write things, when I'm running, I, I literally write things in my head if I'm running. And then I'd all, or in the middle of the night, I'll wake up and I'll have something in my head. Yes, and I'll try, hard. I say to myself, Tony, you've got to remember, that's the idea you had to write in the morning. <laughs> and so often I wake up the next morning and I'm trying to think, what was it? What was that idea I had in my head? Um, it, it, the, the, the time issue is big and the, you know, the headspace, it's, it's a big one, but I think it's amazing what you're saying about the different times, periods in women's life where, where that creativity has a space to grow really. Yeah. Um, I hope that for all of us, it happens at at some point. It doesn't really matter when it is. Okay. I want us to see the text that you brought from Avram Yoshua Heschel um, the text about awe. So tell us uh, why why you've brought it. And, and please so Avram Yeshua Heschel, Rabbi Avram Yeshua Heschel is a fascinating character, um, but his writings really, they speak as poetry. They're beautiful. I find them beautiful. I find their ideas very uplifting. Um, you know, he comes from a Hasidic background and you can see the deep impact it's had on his life. So he says as follows, Among the many things that religion holds in store for us is a legacy of wonder. The surest way to suppress our ability to understand the meaning of God and the importance of worship is to take things for granted. Indifference to the sublime wonder of living is the root of sin. Ultimate meaning and ultimate wisdom are not found within the world, but in God. And the only way to wisdom is through our relationship to God. That relationship is all. What Heschel really is telling us here is that all, rather than fear, because often we translate Yirat Elohim as fearing God. But here Heschel is telling us, and he expands on this later, he speaks about the idea of Yirat Elohim being all. And what he's saying us is that awe enables us to look beyond the horizons of our own existence. That when I, for example, an, a, a, a huge, you know, a macro awe experience would be standing at the Grand Canyon, for example, right? Or watching the birth of a child. These are experiences that engender a huge, you know, a massive sense of awe. But what Heschel is saying, let's find the awe in the everyday experiences. When we taste, when we make a bracha on food, we're meant to be making the bracha and feeling that awe of there is something bigger that I am being what he calls the word that Heschel comes back to you again and again is the notion of radical amazement. And he says, we've lost the ability to be amazed. We have to, we take everything for granted. We think that the world is just a given, right? And that everything is a given. The minute we recognize that nothing is a given and that nothing should be taken for granted. That is the moment we are awestruck. You know, children are awestruck all the time. You walk with a two or three-year-old down the road, everything is fascinating. Everything is awesome, right? Yeah, it's a lot of fun. I do love it. It's a that. lot of fun. It's her. amazing. Yeah, it and, is. We, and we kind of push them along. We say to them, oh, come on, hurry <laughs> up. But <laughs> No, we saw the tractor yesterday. Enough. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Hello, you, you saw it yesterday. It was so exciting today. You know, um, even, you know, even the way a baby feels the shape of something or touches your face. It, and you know what? Also, when you have it, and I think this is where Heschel goes as well, when you're, when you're radically amazed, when you're all, when things are, when you're awestruck, there's also a sense of appreciation, a deep sense of appreciation. If we think about tefillah, that's what tefillah is trying to engender within each and every one of us, that we wake up in the morning and we, you know, tefillah really in its ideal form is meant to 
really um, cultivate a sense of gratitude that, you know, that comes from these or these experience of transcendence. And I think that's really where Heschel is going here. He talks about the idea of all being a sense of transcendence. And when we are radically amazed, when we are awed, when we see awe in our everyday life, what we are really tapping into is holiness. A Yirat Shamayim, somebody who's, you look into now, who are Yirat Shamayim? So it's not always Jewish people, but it's people that recognize that there is something above just the parochial existence of the human being. And and Heschel's right that, you know, when you meet someone who has reverence for something beyond themselves in a really, in a really real way, right? Not in a superficial way, but in a way that they've lived their life and they've gone through and they've journeyed and they've encountered challenges, but they have this deep sense of reverence and awe, that kind of person isn't just willy-nilly going to go out and sin. And I think that is really what Heschel is talking about here. And to me, I think it's one of the most challenging things on a personal level. I find it extremely challenging to be radically amazed and to find the awe in everyday things. Um, I really have to work very hard on myself to do that. But it's something I really try to work hard on because I I really do identify with what Heschel says here. And just to quickly add, I think the last year has made us also really be awestruck by the most simple things um, in a very real way. Um, And perhaps, you know, tear away and uh, rip away even all those layers and layers of superficiality perhaps that, that have that have kind of prevented the awe from emerging in in some senses. Yeah, among the many things we'll take away from. (laughs) Hopefully the year of COVID and no more than a year. That's our current Please God, please God. Okay, we're going to wrap up this conversation, although we could keep going on and on. I feel like that's a sentence I've said in a lot of my conversations, but I really mean it every time. Um, we're going to wrap up with our, uh, with our usual lightning round. Okay. Are you, are you ready for this, Tanya? Are you ready? I'm nervous. I'm round? nervous. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no need. No need. Okay. I have no doubt that I need to ask this in plural, but what books are currently on your night, on your nightstands? Books is exactly the word, but the one that I dip, dip in and out of the most, I think would be, my girls always laugh. They say, Emma, how many books can you read at one time? I don't ask that. Yeah. Uh, Leon Cass, Leading a Worthy Life. Excellent book. I hear that. Uh, also an interesting, very interesting American uh, commentator. And, Fascinating. Uh, Fascinating. He's a great commentary on Sefer Bishit. Yeah. Okay. Who would you like to sit down with for coffee? Or any drink, even if you don't drink coffee. I love coffee. Definitely my weak point. Um, and at the moment, I would say I'd go out for coffee with anyone. <laughs> if I could go out for coffee, it would be wonderful. Yes. Um, I would say a, not a living person, but it would definitely be Ellie Wiesel would be my first choice of person to sit down with. Okay. What's your favorite tefillah? Definitely Kriyat Shema Lamita. I think it's the only time in the day where I really feel like I can focus in on 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 any I find Fila challenging, honestly. Um, you know, I have like I, most I, of us. You're yeah, not alone. But in but it's funny because that's good to hear. Um it's funny because when I do when I learn and when I you know, sometimes like you get a chidush or something comes to you and I feel such a deep connection to something transcendent. So there I have no problem in that area. But tefillah I find very challenging. Um, but the only time I really feel like I can stop and reflect and really kind of think and connect. Um, not again, not every night, obviously, but I definitely would say that that for me is definitely the highlight to feel of the it's day. It's very impressive. At that point, I'm like largely asleep and I can't do anything, <laughs> but I will just respond that um, I think over the years, especially in these young child years, I think I've learned while I've still stuck to the strictures of tefillot, I've learned to think of those moments as tefillah meaning those moments of connecting through le- learning or in the car and you had a thought and you really felt it in your heart. I guess I've learned to redefine those moments as tefillah so that I don't feel so junky about the things that are technically called tefillah. Yeah, um, I like that. 
Like okay. That. I think it's true. Uh, an exotic location you would like to visit? No, you cannot say the next town over right now. Meaning, tell me where you would <laughs> where you would actually like <laughs> to go visit one day. <sighs> Um, the honest truth, I'd love to go to the Great Barrier Reef. I I went scuba diving once and I fell in love with it. I found I felt like I'd gone into a different universe. It was just the most unbelievable experience. I'd love to be able to scuba dive near the Great Barrier Reef. That's definitely. Do you have it. a uh, scuba diving license? Are you that? No, oh, I okay. did it once. <laughs> I did it once, but it was just. Beautiful. Oh, it was in the Maldives, actually. Funnily enough, we went there for our honeymoon oh, wow. uh, many, many, many moons ago, and it was—I just, I don't know—it was like the the silence and the imagery and the colours and being under the water. There was just something, something about Beautiful. it. It's a whole, it's a whole world, Namash. Whole different um, world. Okay, something people think about you that isn't true. That's a really, really tough question. Um, I, I would say, firstly, that I'm a scatterbrain. Uh, I think people think I'm really organized and I'm really not. Um, but I think really that I people seem to think I have the answers because I teach philosophy. And, you know, a lot of people write to me, but, you know, you know, what do you think about this? And what do you, I, people seem to think I have it all sorted and I totally do not have it all sorted. You're like, I went all. into this job because I have too many questions. <laughs> That's exactly it. Yeah. I, and I always, I always introduce my classes by saying, if you come to this class to have to to find answers, you're in the wrong place. So you as well leave. But now nah, I really go to the next classroom. Over, yeah. yeah, exactly. Well, also, you know, when people are students, they, they also, it's it's a natural pull that we want to feel that people have more answers. So I'm sure you help many people on the way to finding them. Yeah, I think I say, I think more than anything is that I can give you a lot of responses and various opinions, but I definitely can't give an answer yeah. to, every, you know, I'm teaching this year the problem of evil. You know, no one has an answer. If someone has an answer to that, you know, they'd have a monopoly on it. I, we would have we would have stopped asking the question about two thousand exactly. years ago. Exactly. Yeah. Um, okay. Hidden talent or talents? Um, I would probably say artist. Artist. I used to paint a lot. I've stopped doing it. I think I've kind of moved my creativity from art to to writing. Okay, well, we'd love to see, uh, you'll put up uh, an exhibit in Matan. I'll let them know, okay? <laughs> yeah, one day. <laughs> okay, to close out our conversation for today, I would love for you to share uh, with us something you're currently grateful for in your life. So there's no question, for the last year, every day during lockdown, I used to say to my kids, however frustrating it was, I said, we have to thank Hashem every day that we have a house and we have a garden, and we live in a moshav with neighbors that we can speak to over the fence, and we have our health, and we have a happy family. Even though there's arguments, and there were plenty, these are things that are the most basic things that we, I literally have been so grateful for every single day. Um, Mamash, the, the, what else? What else do you need? Yeah. I think that's what this mm -hmm. year's really taught us. Well, I really want to thank you for this conversation. I have had a great you, time Yosefa. getting to, to know you a little bit better. And I'm sure that, that so many are going to enjoy hearing from you uh, and this conversation. Thank you. And you're doing, this has been really such, such fun for me. I've never done a podcast like this before. I've enjoyed every minute. You have been a brilliant uh, conversationalist. And I really, <laughs> genuinely, I've loved it. It's been fantastic. Thank you. Well, this is great. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoyed this conversation as much as I did. I'm Dr. Yosefa fogel Rubel, and this is One-on-One -on -one Women Talk Torah, a series brought to you by Matan Women's Institute for Torah Study. Thank you to Sofia Vindish for producing this episode and the entire Matan team for their input. Please do one-on-one -on -one and women's Torah learning a small favor by sharing this podcast with family and friends so that we can reach new listeners. You can stream and download these episodes on Spotify, iTunes, and Matan's website and write us any feedback at podcast at matan.org.il. That's podcast at matan.org.il. Thanks for listening, everyone.